Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to my artist talk and being able to look at my studio in a, in a virtual way. Um, my name is Carlina Grico. I'm a Chinese American non space artist. Uh, at the moment, I live in Brooklyn. Uh, I'm originally from Central Pennsylvania, State College of Pennsylvania, and I'm a photography technician at the Cooper Union School of Art. Um, for uh, my usual practice, um, I do a lot of alternative photography. I do a lot of black and white photography. I do a lot of uh, sculptural and drawing elements in my work. Um, I take a lot of uh, ideas from looking at the landscape, interacting with the landscape. I like to think about looking at the landscape in an archaeological way. Uh, I think a lot about images as objects and how I can make images a little bit more sculptural. <laughs> um, it's been really great to spend time here in Eastport at the Tides Institute and really be able to kind of settle into the rhythm of life here, um, especially with the changing tides, with the water level rising up and down. It's been really fantastic to think about the landscape in terms of volume and sight. So I've developed two projects here while I've been here for the past month, and uh, one is a little bit more conceptual than the other, but both of them are using cyanotype process as the main core connector here. Um, to give you a little bit of background on cyanotypes, you might ask, what are cyanotypes? <laughs> and cyanotype is a alternative photographic process invented around the 1840s. So it was invented before black and white photography, before silver gelatin photography. Um, one of the very first female photographers, Anna Atkins, uh, is credited as one of the greatest artists uh, using cyanotype. She was making prints uh, of seaweed, algae, the natural world, ferns, flowers, and she actually published one of the first books of photographic material of British algae. So it's been really inspiring to use this process also as a female photographer and thinking about landscape and botanicals and figuring out a kind of more sculptural approach to using the landscape material here. Um, and the cyanotype process is also used by um, architects to make literal blueprints. So uh, if you can think of that image in your mind as well, uh, everything is going to be based on that very deep Prussian blue color. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of room for experimentation. So should I let's look at one of my projects? One of my projects. <laughs> So I was very excited to be able to look at many of the state parks here. Um, I was taking pieces of paper. Uh, these are all 20 by 24 size pieces of watercolor paper. And I actually was carrying them around in like a very large dark bag. And I actually took these pieces of paper and I made exposures on the forest floor. So a lot of these are made in a local park uh, called Shafford Penn State Park and also Sips Bay State Park. Um, also Reversing Falls, there, there's a bunch of really gorgeous places to visit here. And through a lot of <laughs> experimentation and uh, kind of trial by fire with this, um, I was able to make all these really um, ethereal shadow prints directly from the light that is filtering through all of the trees. Um, here, I was actually experimenting with installing these on a horizontal plane. Um, again, thinking about the changing ground level here, because it's changing all the time, and also how light is being filtered. 
that maybe this could also mimic sort of a volumetric surface similar to the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, if you look behind you too, some more. And these exposures probably take around three to five minutes each, which is actually very fast for cyanotypes. Uh, and the conditions change on the day and the weather. So I'm trying to do these when it's really sunny outside. Um, so the sun can be like really filtering through the trees and really hitting the paper uh, directly. So it's a lot easier and faster to get all of these colors. Um, I was sort of thinking about what it means to make images like this in the landscape. So it, it's a very like physical way to make photographs here um, because I'm physically laying the paper on the ground. It's, <laughs> it's making contact with the ground, making contact with the light in that way. Um, there's almost no sharpness in, in any of this because there are no objects that are directly touching the paper. Um, These on the wall are made in the same way. Uh, these are bluer because these got more sunlight. So it's a little bit darker here. These I would almost say are overexposed, uh, but you can still see some of the shapes of the shadows that are coming through here. Um, I was actually very happy with uh, how deep this one turned out. So I was very excited. <laughs> possible those of these. So um, we can also segue to the second project that I was working on here. Um, if you remember me mentioning Anna Atkins before, so the first female photographers in her book of algae, uh, it was very inspiring and exciting to collect lots of different seaweed and algae while I was here. Um, there's probably at least 50 different cyanotypes on this, on this display installation here. Um, many different kinds of algae. I made these by contact printing the actual seaweed on the surface of the paper. So, there's the paper, there's the algae, and there's glass, and I'm exposing that straight to the sunlight. So this is a direct photogram of the seaweed. Uh, and then made a cutout of all of the seaweed here. And I actually made these wrapped kind of rock-like structures also out of cyanotypes um, of various sizes. So these are actually images of different parts as well. Uh, and these cyanotypes are toned. And what that means is that I was introducing a little bit more color to these by bleaching them and adding uh, some chemicals to add a bit more of like a brown tone to them. So this entire installation is a uh, cyanotype and toned cyanotype <laughs> sculptural installation here. and. Uh, it was really fun for me to actually play with the flatness and the volume again, because um, when the tides are coming in and out here, you can see the seaweed kind of like go up and also go down. So I was trying to think about a way to actually portray that volume with the flatness of the photographs. And it was really fun to be able to figure out a way to kind of craft them um, with other paper as well. So I would almost call this like some different prototypes are work in progress, but uh, this is really the first time that I've ever made um, like really distinct cutouts <laughs> using cyanotypes here in this way. So it's been exciting to let myself um, play with this. Also kind of get into the history of photography a little bit. <laughs> um, and again, think about how the land and volume change here so often and uh, how to interpret that. Um, I'll show you here uh, 
This is an example of a tone cyanotype. So I actually made a digital image and I printed it out on a digital negative that is to size for the print. And that's a little bit more how people print photographs directly using the cyanotype method. Um, and it is toned a brown color here with tannic acid, which is usually in tea. Um, so this kind of image here, I actually cut up into strips and made into the rock balls that you saw earlier. So I thought it would be nice to show you some of the images beforehand before they got turned into a little sculpture. <laughs> um, it's also been nice to make images and make them not precious by manipulating them again. Um, so in the process of doing lots and lots of printing, um, and then also trying to figure out color, toning, cutting everything up. It's been really freeing and exciting just to be able to kind of sift through all of my material physically <laughs> um, and be able to just kind of play here. So it's been really fantastic to be surrounded by such beautiful landscape and be able to play with it in the studio here. Yeah, I think this is actually right on the shores of Eastport and the Quadi Bay Rocks here. <laughs> so a lot of good vegetation in the rocks here as well. Um, so these are from Sips Bay and Quadi Bay as well. So these are actually the same images here, here, and here here and here and here and here. Um, I just wanted to show you the difference between like the regular cyanotype exposure that you would normally get and then the toned version. Um, there is a lot of variation within cyanotype, so I was trying to give myself some parameters here um, to just stick with one toning color, to just stick with um, roughly five different kinds of paper. <laughs> um, doing a lot of trial and error that way. And uh, I was able to get some tonal variation in seaweeds just from the different amount of exposure time. So the deepest blue that you see is the maximum amount of exposure time. And the lighter blues are a minimum amount of exposure time. And I kind of found by layering that you're actually able to see the strands a lot easier. Instead of having them all be the exact same tone. <laughs> so it's been nice to kind of get a uh, step scale of blue, I guess you could say. And these are actually all held together uh, just with paper fasteners. <laughs> so I'm trying to think about hardware, and uh, this has been a good like first run. I'm trying to think about this and how to fuse them. Mm -hmm. And I also did some lumen printing. <laughs> so, lumen prints took a, a longer time to make, so I didn't get to do maybe as many as I would have wanted. But um, what lumen printing is, is basically taking black and white photographic paper and directly pressing objects onto them, usually natural material objects, um, organic materials. So there's a lot of um, leaves and I tried seaweed as well. Um, and the sharpness again comes from the contact and the different colors are different types of photographic paper. So I think there's at least four different kinds of black and white silver gelatin paper various seaweeds and things getting stuck to it. <laughs> and the thing that's actually exposing it is not just light, but also the actual water content of the organic material that is being squished against it. So it was fun to also place a lot of the plants and the seaweeds here as well, just to see how it would react with the paper.
I do feel like I've been um, having a very tactile <laughs> uh, object approach to thinking about the image, the landscape. <laughs> um, so it's been really fun to gather a lot of these materials, bring them back to the studio again, and uh, kind of see what can happen with them. So. <laughs> So I actually had um, uh, contact frames, like photographic okay. ones with glass. Okay. And the, the seaweed is actually squishy enough <laughs> that it's okay to get sandwiched between uh, some backing board and some glass. So I just put them out in the sun for maybe 10 minutes on a break day. And they got very blue very fast. So. Uh, I was doing a bunch of different processing. Uh, I was doing some shorter times to get some of the lighter blues as well. Um, I was basically, I, I had um, a UV box also here so I could do some tiny photograms at night. Uh, so I was doing some on those as well and uh, letting them dry, pressing them, uh, and then just basically cutting them out with like a very sharp cool scalpel. Um, and I kind of just was, was growing my collection of them. Like I was just piling them up. <laughs> like I, <laughs> I almost felt like a funny chef or something or like a pastry cook that just made so many cookies or something. That I just like, what do I do with all of these? <laughs> um, so it was actually really fun to try to figure out a way to like lift them up also because like, Something that's so fun about making cutouts and collages too is like when you can actually like hold them and kind of see their two dimensionality in their like three dimensionality, if that makes sense. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so it was fun to like see how much like lift I could get out of them <laughs> wow. by attaching them to the other paper structures. Um, the the paper rock structures are actually like this palm leaf ball um, four braided structure. It's 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 usually like a South Asian kind of braiding technique. Actually, it was like used for wrapping rice uh, a while ago, and now it's like an ornamental ball kind of shape. <laughs> um, so I actually found that to be very conducive just for communicating. <laughs> A rock structure because it, it, it was kind of hard at first. Like, I was trying to make like a little basket shape, but then I was like, this is too complicated. Um, I also don't have time to learn back basketry while I'm here. Although, there several um, collections of indigenous basketry here. Um, I was able to go, uh, there's the Passamaquoddy tribe here, and they had some different celebratory days, and I got to see a lot of their basketry work. Absolutely incredible. They're able to see that kind of craft here also that has been in this area for such a long time. Mm -hmm. So I was also trying to think about that in relationship to the landscape. Um, so a lot of thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> the question. Oh, sure. There's a, there's a question in the chat. Um, what are the major minor exposure times for the cyanotype seaweed? Uh, like the, the range, I guess. Probably, yep. Um, probably like three minutes at the shortest to get like a really light pale blue and probably like, and again, in direct sunlight. <laughs> um, in direct sunlight too, uh, probably 10 to 12 minutes for the really deep blue. So you can kind of do different increments to figure out different blues anywhere between there. Uh, Every day is going to be a little bit different, you know, so if it's cloudier out, it's going to take longer. If you're using a UV box, it's going to take longer. Um, if you're using an artificial UV light bulb, it's going to take at least twice as long. So to get a deep blue off of that, that has to be at least 20 minutes. Um, so the sun is actually much faster. <laughs> um, so yeah, 10 to 20 minutes on the UV box, three to 12 minutes in direct sunlight. Okay, so there's a follow-up question. Once the exposure was done, did you cover the paper to stop more exposure? Yeah, um, 
I just have little print bags that are light tight so you can either put them in there. Um, if the seaweed was wet, I did process it right away. Um, if you do process wet objects, it starts the chemical development already. Um, the cyanotypes are developed in water. So any area that touches it that is wet will just be white kind of instantly. So you just have to keep that in mind. If you have seaweed that is kind of dried out a little bit longer, you're not really gonna have that particular uh, problem. <laughs> but it's very easy to do both. Um, just as long as you have a sink waiting for you, it is, <laughs> it is all good. I, uh, I did do a cyanotype workshop here uh, with some people in the community and I did make a handout sheet and uh, I believe that is going to be available through the Tides website as well. Um, so people are more than welcome to look at my handout, uh, you know, email me if you have any questions. <laughs> I always think it's fun to figure out what people are exactly trying to do. Can you apply this process to aluminum? Um, any non-porous surface will need a kind of substrate for the chemicals to sink into. So any metal or glass has to be treated with like a gelatin beforehand. Um, the short answer, yes. Uh, I guess the longer answer is it's complicated, <laughs> but it is technically possible. <laughs> And what piece has taken you the longest to work on? Um, you know, it's funny. Uh, you would think that it would be the seaweeds, but that has actually been a lot easier to predict than how to print. Uh, all of the shadow ones have actually taken me the longest. Um, almost all of these have been double-sided printed because I didn't get an exposure correct. <laughs> So everything that you see here probably has another print in the room that just didn't work. So actually getting like enough information that I was happy with with the shadow prints has been very long because I have to drive to a park. I have to hike a little bit. Again, I, I'm not hiking like miles and miles, but I'm hiking enough where <laughs> I can be in a right, uh, amount of lights in the middle of the woods. So there's enough tree density that none of my highlights are getting fogged, but that there's enough bright light coming through the trees that I'm actually getting something as well. So if you can imagine me uh, hunting for light spots on the ground in the woods, it, uh, it takes a while. <laughs> so just the whole process of finding these exposures, um, very meditative, very nice actually, um, it's been a lot more process oriented than I expected, but it's been a real joy to be able to process everything like this as well. So the, the largest I've ever worked in the in 20 by 24. Um, everything else I've made in New York has been smaller. So it's been nice to be able to actually make something at this scale. Um, I look forward to making larger ones as well. <laughs> Bigger paper, bigger problems. <laughs> bigger dark bags. <laughs> bigger dark bags, yes. Even larger. <laughs> That's when I try to push myself. <laughs> I'm trying to go back home. Super. So yes. I just want to say thank you for everyone for coming to look at my work here. It means so much to me, um, especially during the pandemic and everything. So. Uh, thank you so much. Please find me on the internet um, or reach out if you have more cyanotype questions. <laughs> and I will, um, I'll make sure to share your website, your, you know, on the, the published version of this video. So people who want to see it again and get in touch if they don't know you, obviously some folks um, tonight do know you, know you pretty well, I think. Um, <laughs> But for those who don't or who are watching later, we'll make sure, make that shareable. Awesome. And then I'll just switch really quickly to a quick um, slideshow. So those of you who are 
not able to see in person um, some of the work that Rochelle Hill has um, in process in the studio. Rochelle is from um, Chicago and she's here for two weeks. And in like day seven of a two week term. So um, these are some works in progress that are still being added to. So these are different um, printmaking methods, some direct monotype and some woodcut. And then I just, I took some pictures just throughout the studio. So inking table, drying rack. These are reductive woodcuts um, that are in process. So these are just a couple layers of what will be multi-layer color. And then the pin board um, with some source material. You'll see some objects from our collection. So there's a note card, a photographic note card there that was done on Graham and Ann. Um, and then some of the images coming from some of the research. Um, both um, Rochelle and Harley have been able to go into the museum collections and look at some of our holdings, um, both objects, um, photographic, and then um, print. And then some digital as well. So um, these are from our website and some old historic photographs, aerial photographs of the community. And you can see some of the cutouts um, that are kind of mirroring some of those shapes. And then again, some objects from our collection and research. So if, if you'd been able to join us for open studio this evening, this would be what you might've seen on some of the surfaces. Um, and there's the blocks themselves um, that are in process as reductive woodcuts. Some of the color separation you can see. And this is a method of working two blocks at once on one board. Um, and you can see there, they are the um, inverse image kind of working um, simultaneously on two images. And that's that. So here we are. So um, thank you again, everyone for joining us. And um, I think for those of you who are in the neighborhood, both Harley and Rochelle will be around um, in the late afternoon tomorrow and have studios open if anyone wants to come check out in person again. And then unfortunately, both of them are leaving on Friday. So we're sorry. We're always um, sorry to see the end of a term come about, but it's nice to make connections um, with both these artists. So hopefully we'll be seeing more from them and get to stay tuned on how this work plays out in the future. So thank you all for coming again. We appreciate your support and interest. And I see 